All right, so we are ready to talk a bit more about XAML. And, you know, I've given you that very exhaustive. I know it's a little slow moving tutorial, but he did go, did, he does pretty good coverage of what it is you need to know starting off using XAML, using the uh, uh, universal Windows application platform. So hopefully you've got at least past, you know, these first few tutorials by now. If you haven't, get busy, okay? Hopefully uh, you can find time in your busy schedules. So grids, stack panels, and so on, those are the basic elements. I'm going to talk a bit about them today because I also have a few tips to share with you which, you know, are not just in the material, right? I'm not going to just rely on his tutorials as good as they are. But, so hopefully you've gotten around that far at least. So let me just bring up here the uh, PowerPoint that I'm going to use to guide us a little bit. All right, so for example, okay. Now, it's just another markup language, as we've talked about before. Uh, this particular one is used to define C-sharp classes. Yes, that's the point. You're really writing C-sharp just in a more convenient markup language, but it gets just compiled into C-sharp classes at the end. So, you know, if you have things like a text block and uh, text boxes and so on, it's just a matter in your XAML code, having the opening closing tags. We talked the other day about attributes versus properties. And we even had a quick look at that short video that mentions the attached properties, right? For example, a uh, uh, button itself doesn't have uh, properties for where it's going to sit in a grid, just because that's the layout control that's its parent, right, in the layout uh, tree. But, you know, it does have a way to access those uh, properties of the grid and, and position itself and so on. Okay, so, we, you know, this is pretty familiar stuff. Away we go. Lots of stuff can be done by adding more and more to this. And when you get to more advanced requirements for the graphical user interface of your uh, pages, there's another tool we're going to look at later on called Blend. And he does some tutorials using it as well. It basically was developed separately uh, to some degree as a, uh, a GUI tool to help graphic designers work in XAML uh, without having to know as much about the code and doing more drag and drop and size and move things around on a GUI interface. Plus, you know, it also has more advanced features for doing things like animation, right? There's a tremendous amount of power in this as a presentation tool. There's uh, visual states, there's animations, and a whole bunch of other stuff that you're gonna get to learn about. So, you know, there's an awful lot in Blend that it's very easy to, you can do it all in just the XAML, but you know, we know how sometimes it is helpful to have a tool get some of the boilerplate stuff out of the way for us, right? So we'll be getting to play with that as well. But just to begin with, it's important you understand there are two basic, right, uh, types of controls here. There are container controls and layout controls. Container controls uh, can contain other XML elements. So for example, a button itself, which I referred to earlier, it's an example of a container control. If you scroll up and down, you won't actually find a text property, right? There are basic elements that, that they just have what you see, like a text block, which is like a label. But a button is a container control, so it can contain any other element we so desire, which is very, very flexible because instead of just having, say, like a caption, a text, label, whatever, on the button, because it has, is a content control, it can hold anything. The only real difference between the con container control and a layout control is the container control can only have one element in it. Right? So that element could be any other valid type of element. So it could be a, a media element of some sort playing a MP4 or a, even a video file. Right? You actually see the video playing on the surface of the button if you so desire. Because you, know, you could just embed any other thing, any other element on there that you want. So graphic images and so on, it's easily done. Okay, we'll even do that in a little demo later on today that I have in mind. The layout control has a collection of child objects, right? Uh, now, you know, it's not that much of a restriction in the sense that a content control, because it can have one element, that element itself can be a layout <laughs> control, right? So it could be an, an entire stack panel or a grid, for example, and then you could then arrange things, you know, using that entire layout. But the point is you only have one, right, with a container control. 
Uh, Aleo Control has the entire collection, and uh, you know it's by utilizing this and some of the new features they've added in the latest version for the Windows 10 uh, UAPs that we can really truly make a very responsive design, which allows it then to scale and adjust itself for all different kinds of device families, as we were talking about before. Okay. All right. So. The grid and the stack panel have been around from the early days of XAML, right? Word, uh, Windows Presentation Foundation, okay? Uh, they've made some very small syntax changes over the years, but pretty much they work the same way. But it is, again, a different kind of approach. Now, hopefully you've gotten this far in the tutorial, so I'm just repeating stuff you already know. No harm in that, reinforcing it. But if you haven't, you will find it's a different way to think about grids, right? Typically, most students are most familiar with an HTML table, right? You define your table header tags and table row tags and table data tags, and you have your whole structure laid out with this kind of markup. In order to be responsive from the get-go, this grid layout is different, okay? It has properties for how many and what kind of columns and rows we add. If you don't specify, there's one cell in the grid. It is row zero, column zero, <laughs> right? So that's why you can just use that almost like a, uh, I shouldn't say the word canvas because that is an actual control <laughs> we'll talk about later. But you know, it's just like a surface you can draw things on. You can stick buttons and you can actually use uh, usually like margin properties and things like that to actually place them in specific arrangement on the screen, right? Trouble with doing that though is it's not very responsive when you go for, to a different size screen on a different device family. So instead, you know, we usually actually use the power of columns and rows and the way we can define them in a grid to give us that more responsive design. So how does it work? Well, you see basically inside the grid, of course it will have its own set of attributes. My PowerPoint here is only mentioning a background color, right, uh, and so on. But uh, underneath that you see groups of definitions, row and column definitions, right? So again, this is the kind of thing you can't easily do just as an attribute assignment. You have to do it as a property, right, inside the actual opening and closing grid tags. And this can essentially be done anywhere, although we usually do it at the top, right? But it doesn't actually have to be. And then every other element we throw in there, we can do it in any order we like because it will simply get placed inside whatever row and column we specify. What if I don't specify? Guess what happens? Which row and column would it go into? Yeah, yeah, index by zero, zero, right? So if you don't say otherwise, everything you stick inside the grid goes in zero, zero, right? Which might be fine as far as, uh, you know, some designs are concerned, but that's not usually why you're using multiple columns and row definitions in the first place, right? So that's why we typically then specify in with attached properties in the different elements which column or which row or both they should belong in. Right? Just be aware that if they only mention a column, then the default row is zero, right? Simple as that. Now in terms of the different ways to define heights and widths, you see some examples here, but I'll go to the next slide because I give an explanation there and we'll come back. So basically height and width values can be expressed explicitly, like as a numeric value, Right? And then you can look at you know, what you have to work with and how big it needs to be and so on. I don't in practice actually use these very often. Sometimes you know, when you know you want just a certain amount of space reserved on the screen to show some type of an element. There's nothing wrong with doing that. Uh, the next one is auto. Auto okay, is the actual word you pass as the property for the height or width. And basically that will resize depending on what's contained in the cell. So if it's a bigger element, then it will just give you more width or height, whichever the case is, if it's a column or a row. So it will just automatically size to the content. Okay? Uh, the third one is uh, kind of a twist on the other, star sizing. Basically star, like a wild card, right? Use all available space. Okay? So sometimes you'll just, you might even define that the, the first row is maybe 100 high, the second one is auto to fit whatever's there, and then the third row, you just say star and nothing else. And that will just give however much room there is. So on a big screen, it could be a lot of room. On a little mobile, it might be less room. But it'll just give all the rest of the space to the next row. Okay? And it works the same way for columns, obviously. Right? 
Now a twist on that is we can actually put a numeric value with the star beside it. So then we start getting into uh, proportions, right? So basically in, in my example here, if I go back for a second, like you see there under the grid column definitions, right? I have three column widths defined, one star, two star, three star. So basically add that up, that makes six. Okay, so think of it a little bit like our bootstrap where we had 12 columns and then you would say, okay, well, I want, you know, this div gets so many columns worth of the width and so on and then that will be dynamically changed as things do change on the screen and so on. Kind of along the same idea, but the numbers indicate how much of the available space relative to the other numbers there. So you have to look at the total. In this case, 3 plus 2 plus 1 is 6. So that first column definition would get one-sixth of whatever the available space is. The next one will get a third, or two-sixths, and the third one would get half of whatever the available space is. And that's a really nice way to size things because, again, totally responsive as it goes from one device to another. So that's really all there is about these definitions for rows and columns. And then as you add the elements, as I said, you really can do it in any order because you specify with these attached properties, okay, I'm going to make a uh, text box here. Okay, what row and grid and column do I want it in? You just specify that inside the uh, text box in its, in its actual attribute. And it goes in that placement inside. Now, of course, margins and so on are used a lot to make sure things are, you know, uh, spaced out a little bit. And they're rubbing up against each other and so on and so forth. Okay, so that's basically, in a nutshell, the grid. It's a, it's a different way to think about how you would control a grid layout from anything you maybe have done before. But once you get used to it, you find it's very, very flexible and really quite powerful as well. Okay? All right. So, elements inside just put themselves inside a row or column. As we show here, a, a button in my example could be in grid row one and grid column one, right? Uh, later on, I'm going to talk about what if you want to change that in code later. And there's a little trick to that, and I'm going to share the, uh, as a little tip for you how you would actually do that because it's not as obvious as you might think. Because remember, even just looking at the screen right now, that's grid.row, okay? That's an attack, that property doesn't actually belong to the button. We're putting it inside the button, but it doesn't belong to the button. So how do we refer to that in code? We're going to see the answer shortly. So as I said, it's zero-based, okay? So there's always one default cell, the zero, zero cell, and away you go. All right, now, of course, every one of these cells can contain yet another layout control. Right? So you can make another grid inside one cell grid, and so on and so forth. So you can make it as, as messy and complicated as you want in terms of the hierarchy, but it'll just keep on working, okay? So obviously there's gonna be a limit to, to how much complexity you're probably ever gonna wanna add. But it's interesting to note that there is that flexibility that every one of these cells can itself contain another layout control. Uh, stack panels uh, are used extensively. In fact, you notice in the uh, tutorial series, he tends to use stack panels far more than grids. Right? Personally, I like a grid for the main layout control of the page itself. And then I'll use a lot of stack panels here and there as well. Okay. Oh, that's another difference though. Uh, that last point there in the, on the slide. With the grid view, if things get resized for one reason or another, it allows things actually to overlap, right? And that's in contrast to the stack panel where things will never go on top of each other, okay? So sometimes you desire that and sometimes you don't. So you need to be aware of that difference. Usually when you do some trials and try it on different devices or even changing you know, different emulators you're using and so on, you'll see, oh, that's not going to work very well. I'll have to make a change here because it's not giving me the behavior that I'm after. Okay, so then just to talk a bit about the stack panel, the other, the second most, or for some people, the most popular layout control, right? Uh, it is similar to a div in a sense, right? Basically, you're defining that the elements within the stack panel will either be stacked, okay, remember they don't allow overlap, so the default is vertically. Right? So if you want one above the next, above the next, you just list them and then it will just put them that way. So it's like a div and then it forces it down below. Now you can change the uh, uh, properties of the stack panel so it's a horizontal orientation instead of vertical. And then you can stack things side by side from left to right. Or right to left if you change the property to say which direction you're going from. And of course everything's always flexible, right? 
Now, it will actually literally put them right beside each other unless you specify some margins, which is why you often get into putting margins. One thing that is fortunate, coming to this from the CSS experience you have, is margins work the same way as they do in CSS, right? You get your four digits, so you just, you know, like the left, the top, the right, and the bottom margin, how many pixels you want around any one element. So, you know, with a bit of margin set, then you can use the stack panel and still have them spaced out nicely so they aren't literally rubbing up against each other, which they would by default otherwise. Okay, so vertical by default, left to right flow by default. Uh, as it says there, we're often nesting layout controls inside others, so it's quite often you'll have a stack panel inside a stack panel. And you'll do a few exercises in the tutorial where you do just that. You see how you can actually then have it as it changes screen sizes. You know, things get rearranged in different ways because there's no more room for that stack panel there, so it puts it over here and so on. Okay, so bottom line, grids will overlap controls, stack panels will stack them. They won't let them go on top of each other. Now, it's one thing to be aware of, the page itself is a container control, right? It's a content control, so it only is allowed a single element in the page. <coughs> it's a common error that students make, that I made, <laughs> when you first start out is you think, okay, I'm gonna have a grid at the top, then I'm gonna put a stack panel under the grid, and you go to do that and you're getting this weird error message because the page itself only allows one element in it, right? One layout control. But of course, you can just put a, that's why, I shouldn't use the word root grid, but you know, one main grid, and then you start putting as many layout controls inside it as you want, right? That's just a little thing to be aware of when you're starting out because the content of the page can be a, a layout control so you can have as many depths to your layout arrangement hierarchy as you so desire. Okay, now I mentioned that I had a little tip for you. What if in code you want to modify, right? Because, you know, he did a little uh, thing there where he shows you that this is how you do it in C-sharp and this is how it looks in XAML, right? and you can see how they relate to each other. But one thing not covered in his tutorial is how do I actually in code modify one of these uh, attached properties, right? You might think you just go like this. Say you're working inside, you've got that button like we showed earlier that was in grid row this and grid column that, right? Those were attributes we seem to be setting right inside the button element itself. So in code, you think you might be able to do something like this, but it won't work, right? Because if you think about it, you're saying the button, say my name of my button is btn button, right? Then you would just go dot grid dot row. But grid is not an uh, attribute of a button, right? It's an attached property, so that just won't work. So instead, we use set value. Right? And that's just a simple way around it. Get used to it, because you're gonna use it probably far more often than you'd expect. Right? So the real code would be the name of the control, or element, I should say, okay? btn button dot set value, and then you can pass in the particular value, uh, or property, <laughs> and the value you want. For, right, so uh, you can say grid dot row property, and the IntelliSense will help you there. Right, if you do it this way, it comes up with a list of uh, the attached properties that are available, and so on. Okay, so I just thought at that point we might actually go into a bit of a demo, and we'll come back to the PowerPoint afterwards. So let me just stop running. And I've been doing this lately. I mean, that's ooh, 18 minutes.